Thank you everyone for joining. I hope everyone is safe and well back home. Dear We Empower community, dear Women's Empowerment Principles community, dear UN Women partners and colleagues, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone joining the domestic violence during COVID-19 supporting your employees webinar. My name is Diana Russo, UN Women's We Empower G7 program team. Here in my little corner office in New Jersey slash meeting room, events room, library, meditation room, everything is possible these days. Um, I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for spending the next hour with us. The webinar will showcase business role in addressing domestic violence experienced by the employees working remotely from home in times of COVID-19. We are joined today by our esteemed panelists who will spend about um, time with us and will talk about practices, policies, um, and services that companies would uh, be able and could practically develop and implement to help eliminate domestic violence. Here is our agenda for today. We hope to have more time for Q&A session so we can have a rich discussion. This said, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can enter your question into the question box for the organizer or panelist to answer. Thank you in advance for your collaboration. Next, I would like to invite Dane Semur, Director, Strategic Partnership Division, Johan Newman, to deliver the opening remarks. Then, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Diana. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for finding the time, uh, making the time to be with us uh, in this event. These sorts of gatherings um, I've, I've come to appreciate more and more, as I, as I think many of us have. Uh, these are great opportunities for us to, to come together, uh, share and, and drive our collective action. Um, in addition to thanking all of you uh, for taking part today, I, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge and recognize the uh, colleagues from the European Union uh, who supported this uh, event and the We Empower program and the work of the WEPS um, that we've all been doing uh, and it's the, that support has been very crucial so I think it's important we, uh, we, we recognize that. Thanks also to Jane who you'll hear from uh, in a moment um, for, for the work that's already been done but also in advance for what I know is going to be a, a, a really good uh, presentation that we'll all benefit from. Um, we're taking time today, I think, because we all recognize uh, how important this uh, issue is, um, but also the importance of the private sector uh, and of employers in playing their part uh, in addressing it. Um, we are, of course, when it comes to this issue of COVID and gender, there's a whole raft of concerns uh, of existing inequalities that are exacerbated by the way that societies are responding uh, to, to COVID-19 and the impact it's having on, on, on the health system, but also economies uh, and domestic life, uh, among others. And it's unsurprising, of course, that, 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 that and we anticipated this before we saw a single figure, uh, that, that domestic violence is, is, uh, is very much an issue here. You know, I, I remember many, many years ago in, in, in uh, one of my first jobs, I was working with uh, Save the Children in Palestine. Um, and there, you, there was a very clear correlation between uh, restrictions of movement and domestic violence. Um, and basically, the lesson I think historically has has been um, that where people are, are, are shut together, um, that the domestic violence often, when when stresses are placed on the household, domestic violence tends to to rise. So we know again, you know, we're all very well aware that some one in three uh, women. Uh, in recent statistics uh, show as having experienced uh, violence in some form. Um, we've recently done a study, uh, UN Women working with other partners, that shows that one in three respondents in a survey of 10 countries said, and this is men and women, said that they thought it was appropriate for a person to uh, physically hit their spouse under certain circumstances. So you can see that with that kind of foundation uh, that we're working with, it's completely unsurprising that we would see over the last couple of months all sorts of indications um, that there is this, uh, what we call in UN Women, a shadow pandemic 
uh, of violence against women, of domestic violence. We've seen uh, recently uh, in Chicago, weekly calls to the police up 43% since early March. In the UK, calls to helplines. Uh, last figure I saw was up two thirds, but that was a, a while ago. I'm sure it's even more than that. Lebanon, China, doubling, even tripling of calls to helplines. So, you know, and that's only in places where we have figures and, and, and where those helplines exist. So I think the urgency of this is lost on, on, on none of us. Of course, these women uh, we're talking about who are experiencing uh, violence, and yes, it's, it's not only women, but it's hugely disproportionately women, um, are of course all around us, uh, including in the places we work. And that's why this discussion about what employers can do um, is, is so important. And we're very happy as UN Women to be able to leverage and support through the network of uh, WEPS signatories, uh, such as yourselves and other partners, uh, through networks like the Unstereotype Alliance and elsewhere. Uh, this is our job and we're very, very happy to uh, do it. Um, this is really an extraordinary challenge uh, and extraordinary challenges do demand extraordinary action uh, and extraordinary partnerships. Um, and so we really are uh, not only looking forward to this discussion, um, but all the work that uh, we have ahead of us uh, as we try and tackle this. And again, I do want to reiterate how important the role of our, of our private sector colleagues and partners is in doing this. I've seen already, I've been very uh, pleased to see, very admiring of the work that a number of companies uh, have done. And if, uh, if everybody can step up uh, to that where that high bar is set, I think we can make a significant difference. So uh, I would like to stop there, but again, really, really good to see so many of you uh, on this call and here for this, uh, this event. And I'd like to pass to my colleague, uh, who is much more expert on these issues than I am, uh, Calliope. So uh, I don't know, Dana, if I'm supposed to pass directly to Calliope or if it's via you, but anyway, looking forward to hearing from Calliope. Thank you, thank you, Dan, thank you very much. And uh, hello, colleagues around the world, um, I'm very impressed by this uh, uh, turnout today, but uh, of course it's understandable, as Dan said, that uh, we have so much of increased reporting all around violence against women and girls around the, the world, and we are all somehow connected to, to this phenomenon, either as employers or employees and individuals. And what I would like to, to highlight and emphasize is that uh, increased reporting of violence against women, increased cases of violence against women and girls is not a new phenomenon and it's not something that COVID has created. As Dan said, we have the global numbers. One in three women have faced some form of physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. And I have to remind you that these figures, they do not even include sexual harassment that women and girls face. In every space that they occupy, they face violence and harassment in nearly every space, at home, in and around school, on the streets and public transportation, when they are online and at work. The fact that it's so pervasive indicates that they're not, these are not just random acts by a few bad actors, but there is an underlying condition which allows it to happen on the scale that it does. And we have to be reminded that violence is a product of power and control manifested through inequality. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more later with uh, Dr. Jane Pilger and to see how this is exacerbated when women work remotely from home. The good news though is that we also know that violence against women and girls can be prevented. We have more proven strategies that we know that work and we know also what we can do to support women when violence happens against them in order to remain safe and resilient. We know that everybody needs to play a role if we want to have violence being prevented and if we want to have adequate responses when it happens. Employers in particular are such important allies as work is where we spend the bulk of our days. For some women, the workplace provides the only outlet from their abusive relationship. With COVID, we know that the workplace may have changed and became our little corners at home. 
but at the significance of the workplaces in our lives has not changed. We were very pleased that domestic violence was recognized in last June's adoption of the ILO Convention and recommendation on violence and harassment in the world of work. And this is such a promising step forward. As UN Women, we stand ready to support you and have developed a number of tools to this end. I want to remind you about the handbook on addressing violence and harassment against women in the world of work that we developed together with ILO and Dr. Jane Pilger, who's with us. A global women's safety framework in rural spaces, drawing on the tea sector with relevance to other commodity sectors together with Unilever. And I know that uh, Unilever is represented here today and we're very happy about this. And uh, also in the uh, next few days, we're going to, to have a summarized tool providing some guidance of what workplaces can do right now to adapt their support to survivors when they work remotely. I very much look forward to this discussion and I would like to introduce, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Jane uh, Pilger, who's an international expert on gender-based violence at work. She's a senior visiting fellow at the Department of Social Policy and Criminology at the Open University UK. She's a former specialist advisor to the UK's House of Commons Select Committee on Employment. She has specific experience in developing policies and guidance on ended sexual harassment and domestic violence in the world of work and she has been working with ILO and UN Women and other uh, international uh, organizations and companies. Dr. Jane Pilger, we are very, very happy to have you here. Thank you for, for being here with us today. We're looking forward to this discussion. And uh, we heard that uh, domestic violence is increasingly becoming a problem during the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you please explain to us in what ways does this affect women working remotely from home? We know that it's a manifestation of power and control. It's not just some random acts by some bad actors. How does this power and control play out in this situation of remote working? Over to you, Dr. Pilger. You, you're muted. Oh, am I um, Is that working okay? Yeah. Um, Hi everybody, it's fantastic to see so many people here today. I see there's 447 participants already, that's brilliant. Um, and it's so great to see such a lot of interest in this really important topic. It's where to start on this issue. I mean, one of the things we know about the COVID-19 pandemic is that more and more women are working remotely from home. They're doing teletravail, they're working from via telephone, via online meetings. And we know that when you're working remotely, it's more likely that abusers will have opportunities to exert power and control. Because we have to remember that domestic violence isn't just about physical violence, it's about coercive control, psychological control and so on. And we know also from surveys across the world that up to a third of all women employees have, have experienced some form of physical, um, psychological domestic violence during their lifetimes. That's working women. So we know also that the figures of domestic violence have gone up significantly with the lockdowns because when people are confined, they've got financial stress, they're in crisis, they're anxious and so on. This may exacerbate existing domestic violence and abuse that might be present anyway, but it might arise for the first time. And I think one of, Calliope, you um, pointed to this, one of the things that has been really important about the companies and employers that have begun to address this issue, and I have to say there are many examples all across the world at the moment of companies of trade unions, of the social partners negotiating workplace policies, collective agreements, of company strategies and initiatives on this issue. Because many companies recognize that domestic violence affects their bottom line. It affects productivity, it affects retention of, of their staff. 
They also know that it's a safety and security issue when it follows women into the workplace. So, one of the things that we need to address during this COVID-19 crisis and pandemic, as more and more women are, are confined in the home, is how to find safe ways that they can communicate, for example, with a manager or a colleague or a work friend or somebody that they can talk to to help them access a service. And we know that being confined and isolated is a real issue for many women. I live in France myself and in France and in Spain also, they have allowed, uh, and many countries, Canada, in Canada, in Italy, many countries across the world, that accessing domestic violence services, for example, have been designated as essential services that enable women to leave the house to go and access those services. But in some cases, it's been really hard for women even to get to a telephone. In the first two weeks of the lockdown in Italy, for example, the, um, the National Help, Helpline Telephone Arosa reported a 55% reduction in calls to their national helpline simply because women couldn't get to a telephone. Now, we also know that, you know, conversely, that, uh, you know, that the, the increases in, in calls to national helplines in the UK, in France, in many countries across the world, in Mexico, up 60%, in France, up 30%. In, in some UK helplines, uh, a daily reported increase of, of, of 40, 40 to, to 60%. So we know that women are being harmed, that they're being confined unnecessarily in the home, even when they're allowed to go out to the supermarket or the pharmacy. So what we know is that it's also much easier to disrupt a woman's work when, when there's confinement. So it's much easier to, for an abuser to control, to have surveillance of what's happening, uh, of their movements. They might be destroying work equipment like the computer or the telephone. They might be controlling access indeed to the telephone um, or an online meeting. And for a lot of women working in kind of remote, remote working, the only contact, because the only contact is behind the phone or, or online in the conference, it's much harder to find a safe way to communicate with somebody. Now, what's, what we do know from some companies is that they are already adapting their existing workplace supports to a remote working setting. So it's trying to find safe ways that women can communicate, for example, with their manager. There's other issues that also we need to take into consideration because when women are, I'm, I'm talking about women here because it is principally women who are affected by domestic violence and abuse. Um, there are also issues, important questions that we need to be asking employers about their duty of care towards their employees who are working from home. And this is what some companies are now grappling with. What does that mean? What does it mean about health and safety, for example, when the workplace is the, is the home? So what does it mean if there's no access to hand sanitizer or soap? Because that could be some of the form of control. Um, and I suppose that, you know, just the final issue to, to raise on, on just this part of, of the discussion, uh, Kelly, appears just about um, how managers in particular who have perhaps been trained to identify some of the signs of domestic violence and give support in the workplace if there's a workplace policy, it's much harder to recognize the signs of domestic violence because there may be signs of distress that are related to other factors such as childcare or other difficulties people are, are, are facing. So I think there's huge challenges, the, the confinement, the stress, the anxieties, link in with the point you were making about power and control. And we have to keep remembering that this issue is an issue about power and control, and it's power and control that increasingly is in, in, in taking place in the home, depriving survivors of their agency, their voice, their confidence, mm. sometimes making it really difficult for them to, to report. And it's so much harder to do that. Mm. That's, uh, that's uh, fantastic. You, you said uh, the stage uh, in a very specific way and there are so many challenges for survivors to, to have access to services and uh, also you uh, highlighted the challenges that also employers face 
and uh, how we can define duty of care for safety of their employees at home. Uh, but they have a huge role for com companies that they can uh, play and they can adapt the work that they have already been doing before to, to support survivors from domestic violence. So what role do you think they can play now and adapt this type of work? You, you refer to that, how they can read the signs of distress, probably mm -hmm. having some special uh, way of communicating if they recognize some signs of domestic violence and distress. Can you please tell us a little bit more about how they can adapt they role during uh, these remote arrangements. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm drawing on some examples of work that I've been doing with companies with social partners on this issue because more and more companies are looking at how they can adapt their existing policies or indeed even start a new policy. And I suppose one of the issues is, you know, that this is about making sure that there are specific responses that are relevant to the situation that the women are in. So for example, if this is a new issue for somebody, if this is the first time that domestic violence and abuse has, has been perpetrated, oh, I'm so sorry. I should have cut that off. It's actually my mother's birthday today and she's just, she's just sending me a, <laughs> a, a message to her. I tried to FaceTime her earlier, but anyway, so, um, so I think, you know, it's about tailoring the, 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 the support. If it's a new situation, it might be about ensuring that the woman has access to information where she can get legal support, uh, support around uh, kind of, you know, how to get a protection order. If the, 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 the situation of abuse might be of an ex-partner who is now harassing her for the first time. Um, and there may be a situation where a couple, oh, so sorry. There may be a situation where an abuser and uh, a survivor are working in the same workplace as well, in which case there needs to be specific actions taken there. And then finally, there may be um, a, a, a continuation of support that has been started already where somebody has you know, perhaps being supported by their manager or by a workplace representative or by a colleague is how to adapt that support to a safe situation. So one of the things we're saying, saying is the importance of communication, communicating regularly with employees and team members, keeping that up, staying in, staying in touch, building trust, communicating messages to all employees to say, you know, we know during a lockdown that domestic violence has increased. We know that this is an issue um, and to encourage survivors to seek help, stressing that, you know, this would be without recrimination and that, the, and that the manager is there to give support. Keeping in contact through regular kind of company communications messages, you know, so that, that, that there's regular support um, available, keeping in touch with the manager on a regular basis, giving reassurance, constantly giving reassurance, encouraging people to sort out um, some support to help them with their own safety planning. The second issue is, is, you know, how a manager, there may be team meetings and regular phone calls being made. Spotting the signs, as I mentioned, can be very difficult, but it's really important to be uh, attentive to the potential signs of domestic violence. You know, if somebody's being distant or withdrawn, or if they're not fully participating in online meetings, if they're being interrupted regularly, you know, there might be a situation where the phone isn't working or the online resource isn't working. Those may be potential signs. They may be potential signs of something else, but it's also important to be um, attentive to them. Adapting workplace supports to the new reality of, 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 uh, of, of COVID-19 is really, really important. And as you know, many today, many, many companies have developed company policies, procedures, guidance for managers. There are collective agreements, there are workplace policies. So adapting existing workplace supports is really important. Um, and ensuring that 
you know, that, that, that for example, if somebody is already being supported, having a safe code, a safe word or a set of safe words that, for example, can mean contact the police, I'm in an emergency, or I need to talk to a professional or a domestic violence specialist to give me legal advice. Code words can be very useful. Um, there may be situations where a victim of domestic violence has left the family home and is in temporary accommodation. Here is where the employer can also play a really important role in giving support to somebody who perhaps is in temporary accommodation or in a refuge, making sure that they've got access to their work computer, to a mobile phone, which might have been left in, in the family home, and making sure that you know, there is support to enable her to continue working. One of the things that a lot of companies have introduced is the provision of paid or unpaid leave. In, you mentioned earlier ILO Convention 190, that does provide for, you know, the, the, one of the provisions for mitigating domestic violence in the workplace is, is to have um, a provision of leave. In the policy brief that uh, we've written that will be published soon, um, one of the issues that we identify is the use of paid leave during the COVID-19 pandemic. So make sure that you know, your employees can have, have some access to paid leave if the situation is really difficult, if they've had to move from the family home, if they're attending or accessing essential services, it could be counselling, it could be legal support, it could be attending court and so on. And then I suppose the other issue is that more and more managers um, and companies are looking at ways to provide up-to-date information about referrals to online or telephone support um, from domestic violence organizations, specialist organizations, and so on. So that, you know, and very simple advice can be to have, you know, access to these emergency contact numbers in a safe place on the mobile phone. And there's some really good examples from companies um, about how they have used their own networks, their campaigning and social media capacity their philanthropic um, capacity to develop partnerships with domestic violence organisations, information. I mean, Kering, who is a long-standing um, WEPS uh, uh, signatory operating in France, Italy, UK and the United States, has developed an awareness campaign, hashtag you are not alone, uh, which is aimed to help put uh, victims of domestic violence in contact with domestic violence organisations, but also to give resources and leverage of the resources of companies to give resources to domestic violence organisations to ensure that those services continue during the, the pandemic. And there's examples, there's the one in three women corporate network, for example, that is a network of French multinational companies that are now working and using their expertise they're bringing together you know, a whole network of uh, 10 or more companies working together using their added leverage, their financial resources to help support the National uh, Federation um, of, of Women to ensure that there's, there's continued access to local support. And then there's things like collaboration between businesses, the Business Fights Poverty, um, network of multinational companies who look at the issues of violence and other um, purposeful activities across the supply chain have looked at this issue of domestic violence at work, of harassment and increasing levels of, of online harassment uh, and abuse taking place while women are, are working in, in lockdown situations. They've developed an action toolkit and they've been supported by Avon and other companies in this initiative and I think it's really they're really good examples of how companies have come together brought their expertise brought their their resources into um, and indeed also their tech support some people may have heard of the bright sky app that was developed by Vodafone that is now launched in a number of countries across the world so, and then there's a few companies that have developed global policies like Vodafone, Rio Tinto and others who are now adapting their company programs, their workplace policies to remote working. And some of these are based on the principle of, you know, helping managers to recognize the problem and recognize it while it's a difficult situation of working remotely. 
Ensuring that managers respond in appropriate and effective ways. That means also making sure that managers don't assume that they're the experts, but that they can develop workplace supports to help um, women affected. And then to refer on where relevant to relevant um, you know, domestic violence, legal support um, and other organisations. Trade unions are doing many, of, uh, are also developing much of this work to support their colleagues and working with employers to develop agreements around this. And I think these are really important initiatives and there's some very, very good learning from them about mm. what the possibilities are. This, uh, this is excellent. And I know that we have some of the companies you, you mentioned with us uh, uh, today and they are signatories of uh, the webs as well and they definitely produce some very good practices that uh, also we are including in the policy brief that we have developed and it will be available in a few days so it can give some practical examples of what companies did uh, to inspire other companies what they can have in place this could be um, as immediate responses already building on the work that has pre-existed uh, before COVID-19. How would you see in the, the longer term, how can we start part, planning in general for new ways to address domestic violence in a changing world of work? We might see patterns right now, uh, remote working um, arrangements, they might be uh, be in place in the, the future, for example. So how can we think differently right now? And what are the building blocks that we need to have in place right now? Mm. And to use uh, this space to implement some more radical uh, changes. What would be your vision for, for the future, James? Uh, okay, yeah, this, uh, it's a really important question because I think what the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us is that, you know, Domestic violence has been there. It's helping, maybe it's, it's opening up spaces for us to think about domestic violence and think about the responses that everybody needs to have to domestic violence for all stakeholders and for the private sector and for employers to play their role. So thinking about the longer term, let's, let's, let's think about how we can rethink how the private sector can work together. Um, with other stakeholders to end domestic violence. And I mean, as, as you say, even with the ending of lockdowns or the partial ending of lockdowns in some countries, and as some women return to work, it's likely that there's going to be a further increase in requests for workplace supports. Interestingly, now that the lockdowns are beginning to end in countries like France, Spain, Italy, Managers and companies that have existing policies are finding that now women have got access to phones, that they're coming back into the workplace, that they're asking now for workplace supports that they were unable to work, what that they were unable to ask for um, before. So let's use this as an opportunity to think about creative ways. Let's think outside of the box a bit more about how we can end domestic violence. It's it's I mean it's it's really. You know, it's really a critical issue that if one in three of all women experience domestic violence and those numbers have gone up, those numbers have gone up during the COVID-19 crisis, what can we do? What, how can we use innovation, dialogue, collaboration, you know, with governments, with workers' organisations, with employers, with service providers, non-governmental organisations, how can we work together to end this pandemic, this second pandemic or this hidden pandemic? How can we break the silence? One of the things we know from surveys that have been carried out across the world is that women don't speak up about domestic violence because of victim blaming, because there's a silence around it, there's shame around it. Women are frightened that they'll lose their jobs, that there'll be recrimination at work. We need to break this silence. We need to ensure that women can safely have conversations with their colleagues about domestic violence and about how they can be supported and I think the other long-term issue is how can we make sure that women can live safely in their own homes? Because one of the problems um, for many women is that the only way they can get out of a domestic violence situation is to leave the family home, often going into homelessness, into other forms of vulnerability. 
And we know that by the time women get to refuges, often they've left their jobs as well. So how can we ensure that women can stay safely in their homes or have access to secure, long-term, good quality accommodation? The second issue I'd really like to stress is how we build, you know, in our workplaces, how do we build a culture of an environment at work where men are allies in ending domestic violence? And, you know, this could be allies around other forms of workplace violence and sexual harassment as well. But also this means that we need to be thinking about better ways of holding perpetrators accountable. Be there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of development of research and some movement towards um, holding perpetrators accountable by looking at how perpetrators can change their behaviour through perpetrator treatment and counselling programmes, what we can do to ensure that those are safe um, for, for, for women, that there are perpetrator treatment and, and counselling programmes that genuinely find ways of changing behaviour. Because we won't change domestic violence unless men change their behaviour. We need to do that in a culture of gender equality and a more gender equal world. So there's a lot we can learn from what companies have been doing. There's a lot we can do around workplace policies. We'd encourage everybody to be, of course, using ILO Convention um, 20, uh, and, and Recommendation 206 of encouraging as many governments as possible to use that framework and ratify the convention. And, you know, just finally, just to say the word, you know, what's the vision? Well, we want a vision of a world that's free of domestic violence, and we want one that's based on gender equality, that affords people their dignity, the agency of all women and men. And we need to have, through this, a transformational effect. Mm -hmm. so let's look at the role of the private sector. Let's look at what companies can do. Let's make sure that every workplace has a workplace policy. You know, that would be a really start, good starting point. A workplace policy that all employees trust and that they can use to have support. Um, and that all, everybody in the workplace is, tra is trained to address this issue of, of violence against women. So I could go on for the vision for a long I know, but uh, this, time. These are very important recommendations and I think you set the stage already. We already have plenty of questions from our participants. So I think we, we need to open the, the space for, for some discussions and to answer these uh, questions. So Diana, uh, over to you. Jane, thank you so much. That was really good and very important, your, your interventions and discussion. Diana, over to you. Thank you so much, Calliope. Thank you so much, Jane. First of all, I would like to mention that we received numerous uh, messages uh, saying happy birthday to your mom Jane and all the wishes uh, at the end of a webinar we'll compile so and it will be a wonderful card for your mom so happy birthday from all of us <laughs> she likes it and we have a lot of questions so i will try to compile them and so i hope jane and calliope you will decide who will start and so we can try to respond as many as possible so first, Janet is asking, how do we handle cases of domestic violence whereby the managers are male and the domestic violence victims are women who are not comfortable reaching out to their male counterparts for assistance, specifically um, their managers? Um, yeah. Over to you. Okay, uh, just very briefly to say this is, you know, might be a situation in many workplaces. So what some really um are some really good examples of companies that have developed pro advocate advocates programs i mean in canada they have a fantastic um system that they put in place it's the uniform trade union with the employers have developed an advocates program where employees are trained up to give confidential advice and support to victims of domestic violence now that is a really good way of opening up a conversation but I think what, what companies need to do is to have the clear lines of communication. So if the manager is male and you don't feel able to trust or, or to talk to that manager, that there's a named person, for example, in HR that you can talk to. 
And I think having somebody, having a unit in HR, if you're a large company, having a unit where there's some named people who you can go to, who you know you can trust to have a conversation or some confidential support, that's really important. As a follow-up question, Calliope and Jane, um, our, our participants are asking, how do we ensure that managers will maintain confidentiality? This is one. And also because we mentioned earlier about trade unions and the role and the research and the work we are doing, Vicky is asking, um, can Dr. Pillager address the role that trade unions and collective bargaining can play in helping address domestic violence at work? And talk a bit about the work of the labor movement has done. Maybe some surveys, uh, legislation reforms, um, or training. Unions are important partners in helping recognize and respond to domestic violence when it comes to work, whenever the work is remote or in the workplaces. So mm -hmm. over to you, Calliope and Jane. Okay. I don't know if Calliope want to say something. I have something. I can respond to both questions. You have been working with the trade unions a lot and, and you have advice, so please go ahead. Exactly. Well, just to, to um, respond to Vicky's question. I mean, when, when the, do you remember the, uh, during the negotiations for the ILO convention uh, that took place in Geneva last, the final part of the negotiations last June, and it was made up of the workers group, the employers group, and the, um, and the governments. And actually, we, at the time, were looking at, you know, how many workplace policies there exist, what collective agreements um, have been addressed. And one of the things that was just fantastic to see was the number of negotiated collective agreements between the trade unions and the employers on this issue. And I think Vicky is absolutely right. You know, the labor movement and trade unions have a crucial role to play because they're often in touch with their employees. I mentioned the uniform. Um, scheme earlier, but I do know in quite a lot of countries, workplace representatives have been trained up by the trade unions to give advice and support. I know in Denmark, <coughs> for example, this has been carried out by a network of, of trade unions who've worked together on equality and they have trained their stop, shop stewards to address the issue of domestic violence, give advice about developing workplace supports and actually they have been the instigators often of the workplace policies and the employers opening a door really to the employers to, 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 to do this work and I know in France where there's a kind of requirement on companies under the law to negotiate on gender equality every two years that a lot of the unions are now putting this issue on the renegotiation of those collective agreements and the employers are delighted to see that happening. I have to say it is one area where there's a real win-win. You know, that, that, that there's a lot of agreement um, between the employers and the trade unions in the develop, development of both sectoral agreements, but also workplace agreements on this issue. It benefits everybody. And I think it's really important to take account of this um, and the role that trade unions and the insights trade unions can bring into the issue of workplace policies to make sure that they're relevant uh, to the workforce. The first question, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, um, uh, uh, was about how do you assure confidentiality, confidentiality of managers? This is where, you know, I want to come back to the issue of trust. Women will only trust a workplace policy or a system for support if they believe that they can absolutely have confidentiality in, in, in talking. And you know, people gossip in workplaces. So you need to know that you can be assured of that confidentiality. And I think the way to do that is to make sure that there's effective training for managers in keeping confidentiality and understanding the risks for somebody if that confidentiality is breached. Because if an abuser finds out that somebody has been talking about their abuse at work, their life will be at risk. That is a simply, you know, it's the simplest way of putting it. 
that that confidentiality is, is crucial for um, a woman's uh, uh, safety and security. Thank you, Jane. Um, I, uh, we shared a little bit of practical example. For example, you, you mentioned about France and here Christina is mentioning. In Germany, we try to make supermarkets print helping numbers on all the receipts. Are they more creative ideas to shorten the handles to support we can learn from? And um, if you can give several examples. Also speaking about the technology, the developments, and um, we have several questions. Uh, how can artificial intelligence and the new technologies change the scene? How technology with partnership from all these multinational companies can help in addressing domestic violence? Mm. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of questions to answer. I'm not an expert on technology, but I do know that there's a lot of tech supports that are being put in place. I mean, there are, for example, ways in which a mobile phone can give geolocation for emergency support without an abuser being able to track that. Because one of the things we know from uh, mobile, mobile phone, I mean, one of the, the, the pieces of advice that's always given to women who have mobile phones is to, tra to, to shut off their tracking systems, simply as that. But there are geolocation possibilities without an abuser being able to track that, 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 that location so that somebody can access immediately emergency support. I mentioned the Bright Sky app from Vodafone and there's various um, incarnations of that that Vodafone has used across the world that helps with safety planning, that helps with, with accessing information, that you can then plot where the local service is. So I think let's harness the technology um, for the benefits that it can have around accessing services. I think that the other, the other issue is that we need to be very mindful of is, is the way in which abusers may well continue abusing even after a relationship has ended and there's a partnership has, has has ended so what can you do to address online you know one of one of the the issues around online abuse by email by telephone by mobile phone so in the workplace there's things that you can do around that like diverting calls um, to another member of staff and finding safe ways that you know, a, a, a member of staff can communicate with her manager, for example. So those kind of supports can be put in place. The question was, you know, just about, uh, you know, how to alert, uh, you know, how to alert women about access to services. There was a wonderful example from a pharmacy company in, I think it was Bolivia, uh, where a woman had, uh, it was Bolivia, um, had, had there been a femicide and the company where she had worked wanted to do something. So it's a pharmacy company and they started putting just a little bit of information on a box of um, you know, sanitary products that women were accessing. Simple things like that. In France and Spain, there was the, there's a, a code word that can be used in the pharmacy, for example. That is that the pharmacists are then trained to respond to for some emergency support. So I think you know there's lots of ways we can help uh, with giving during, particularly during a lockdown, giving women access to to safety supports. But getting that information out there is 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 really difficult. It's 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 really important that that's done safely. And that there's ways in which women can access that that information in a safe way without there being further recriminations to them. We saw we have so many questions, so it's so hard to select. Uh, we try to vote on the questions. Um, so apologies if your question will not be answered, but we will do our best together with our colleagues from Ending Violence Against Women and Girls section and, uh, and our team to respond in a follow-up email or article so that we will provide as many resources as possible. So probably the last two questions in our Q&A. Is there a way for organization to measure the impact of efforts are having on domestic violence? And another question from Alice, 
I want to have a session with all female staff in our organization on how they are coping up with the lockdowns. Is there a guideline or questionnaire on key issues to cover, which can help us look at all this issue and to serve some recommendations? Mm -hmm. um. Okay, just on the, the second question, is there a guideline or... Uh, yes, there is. Um, and in fact, uh, Vodafone, I don't know if there's anybody from Vodafone here today, but Vodafone has a, an employer's toolkit, for example, that gives guidance about what can be done and that's available online. It's just being updated actually with the Vodafone kind of resources for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there's a few other resources online from employers and there's also the UN Women ILO handbook on addressing violence against women in the world of work, um, which actually is maybe a useful resource because it gives some of the background information, but it also gives some tips and hints of things to include in policies. But I, no, I'm not aware of something that's a specific checklist about, you know, how to have that conversation. I think it's split into, you know, what can be what can be developed in a policy, what you can do to raise awareness and so on. Um, and maybe what we could do, um, you know, when the um, brief, you know, the new brief will be circulated soon, is possibly to add a list of resources that are available that people could access for some of this information. Um, and the I, I, sorry, the first question you asked, um, I, I think it was some, something about efforts to address the impact of, of domestic violence and I didn't hear... Measure, the, to measure the impact. Oh, to measure the impact. Yeah, really difficult, very difficult question to answer because when you're offering a confidential service, you may not be measuring that itself. I know uh, from research I was doing a couple of years ago, I did try to look at how to measure this um, and I did contact the organisations that were implementing domestic violence policies and they said, no, this data is not. So I think there's ways in which you can collect anonymised data through workplace surveys, for example, and we need more anonymised workplace data on the impacts of domestic violence. We also need, we, we, need, we need that data because we need to know more information about you know, who, is who, is, who are the perpetrators, who are the victim survivors. We need to know how their work is being affected. And there's been a few workplace surveys carried out in a few countries across the world, and there's been a good methodology for this developed by researchers in Canada. Um, and maybe we could, one of the things that, you know, we could be looking at in the future is some guidance about how to collect that disaggregated data in a way that is anonymised um, and to look at some of those outcomes through anonymous questionnaires. Thank you so much. Um, Calliope, Jane, will you have any final remarks before we will uh, hand over to Anna for some closing remarks based on the questions and, and then the, the, all the discussions we had so far? Well, just, just very briefly to say, you know, um, if, if you're attending this webinar and you're from a company that's just beginning to think about what you could do around domestic violence, I would really encourage you to be thinking about, you know, what are the kind of supports you have currently in the workplace? You know, there might be leave policies, for example, that you already have. You could adapt those to give um, leave for victims of domestic violence. I think there's also really important resources that we can make available to you that can give you some guidance about drawing up workplace policies, about ensuring women are involved in the development of those policies particularly also workplace representatives and trade unions and that there is you know that we want to make sure that those those measures are effective and trusted so i would encourage anybody here who is involved in any way in a company to think about what kind of supports you can be giving in the future because you could make a real difference 
Yes, uh, thank you, Diana. And if I uh, may share as well that uh, I think it's really important, as uh, Jane has uh, beautifully highlighted so far, how important it is to, to foster a culture of uh, trust in the workplaces in order to uh, encourage uh, the employees coming up uh, with uh, cases uh, of abuse and really trusting the workplace to uh, help them uh, find some uh, uh, solutions to, to their problem. Uh, I think that would be very important. And also the, the second point I would like to, to raise, how important it is to, to have senior management uh, support on this initiative in order to, to have the longer term uh, impact that we would like uh, to, to see. And I would encourage also, it's the employers, but also all employees, I saw at some point some questions around the, the role of uh, men and male employees uh, in uh, workplaces. We all have a role to, to play as active um, bystanders of how we can identify uh, some um, messages and some signs and how we need to intervene and to uh, break that uh, culture of uh, uh, misogyny and uh, how when we catch all this messaging from other um, colleagues, etc., to be able to actively uh, have some messaging around that. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to share with uh, all, everyone that we received also such a positive feedback already. We appreciate everyone um, feedback and inputs. And once again, we will share all the links. I see that a lot of participants also are sharing the links from their work. So uh, I'm sure that our teams will study them and we will share in turn with all the participants. And now uh, I would like to invite Anna Feld for closing remarks. Anna is the manager of Queen Power Program and the head of Web Secretariat. Anna, over to you. Thank you so much, Diana. And thank you so much, uh, Dan, Calliope and Jane for an amazing conversation today. Um, I think I'm, I'm very inspired by all the questions that we have received and all the, not only congratulations to your mother, uh, Jane, but uh, all the congratulations for an, a wonderful discussion. Um, it's been very, very helpful. And I do see that there's a lot of work to be done based on the questions and, and the request for more information. Um, we, I've seen also that we have a lot of our um, webs network with us today. Uh, but also many other people that might not yet have signed the, the women's empowerment principles. And I encourage all of those who haven't done so yet to come to our uh, WEPS.org website and, and do make the commitment for the broader gender equality agenda. Um, what the conversation that we had today has mainly focused on uh, the principle three, which focus on health, safety, well-being of all workers. But it touches very much, as both Calliope and, and Jane has, has alluded to, um, trust and culture, which is the, the basic for any of those principles, of our seven principles, to be implemented. And uh, we are working, and we've been working with both Calliope's team and, and Jane on a brief that will come out uh, later this week. Uh, and for everyone that have been part of this webinar, we'll share with you the link. Uh, to the brief uh, together with the recording and um, just a little insight to, to what's coming. Uh, we are going to focus on uh, both the immediate measures um, that can be taken today uh, in view of COVID-19, but also the, the medium and long-term um, measures mm -hmm. that are required. And uh, in the immediate measures, it's really about leadership. And leadership is also the one that drives the culture um, so the CEO, whether it is in a multinational, we heard from many of, this, of the participants that you really like to um, hear also what's happening in the small and medium-sized enterprises. And uh, as the Web Secretariat, we welcome, of course, any one of you to share those examples with us. Um, and many of the examples that we're using is because they've been shared on our platform and, and with us. Um, it's also about leveraging the company's resources and influence. 
Um, and influence is not only uh, through money. Uh, influence can be done by stepping up as leaders. And we heard a lot of questions also around uh, the role of men. Uh, the men also stand up for, for these issues. And um, we have a new and women, our He For She initiative, that is about um, um, celebrating the men that are stepping up for, for gender equality. Mm -hmm. But also in the medium long term, we'll cover um, different recommendations on how to create a future where women are safe, no matter where they work, whether they are working from home or they're working in the workplace. Um, so I'd like for each of you to um, make a commitment to, to really see how you yourself can contribute to making women's work life more safe. And, and, um, and that I think one way is really to share this brief that we are working on and that we'll share with you as widely as possible. So that as many employers, as many organizations really take this agenda on and make uh, it a reality, women's uh, safety a reality, both at home and at work. So um, I encourage all of you to go to webs.org uh, where we have not only um, a range of different uh, COVID-19 related resources, but also other resources on equal pay. We also have a forthcoming guidance on sexual harassment in the workplace, um, among many other issues. So please visit the website and we'll communicate with you um, all of the, um, the, the, the resources that we have. And I just would like to thank Dan, Calliope, and Jane so much today, and for the participants for your wonderful qu uh, questions and insights and links and everything. So thank you so much and uh, have a nice rest of the day, evening, and I see there's a lot of people in East Asia. So um, good night to you over there. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go, just the one minute, um, we would like to have your feedback in order to understand how we all did today. And if you also would like to, for us to organize a follow-up webinar. So two short questions, if, um, and this is just two more minutes. Um, we would like to know how satisfied are you with the information received? Please share responses. It's important for us to, to know um, the questions and also your feedback. Thank you so much. Um, I think we did well. <laughs> um, we appreciate. Um, and one more question. We would also like to know how informed are you with the strategies companies can put in place to make sure that no matter where a woman work, whether at home or at work, they will be uh, safe and well. Thank you so much, for everyone, for your responses. We are happy that today the session helped the majority of you to get more information, and we will make sure to share even more from now onwards to, to help you um, understand better the policies and also implement those. Um, thank you, everyone, again. Have a good day and a good evening and see you next time. Stay well. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you.